So we've already been using this normal equation and it has uh, some limitations. And in particular, in order to solve for the parameters of, of the model, we have to go through this process of inverting an, essentially an N by N matrix, uh, where N is the number of uh, input features that we have. Uh, and this inversion process uh, can get really expensive as uh, N uh, becomes much larger. Uh, so in, on our conventional laptop computers, it's easy, easy to get N up to 1,000 or 2,000. Uh, but as we start to get much bigger than that, we, we actually have to pick up and start moving to uh, supercomputers. And, and often, that that uh, computation time is also a lot of that is wasted if we have uh, feature sets where uh, there are a lot of zeros uh, hiding uh, in the feature values. So that's what we mean by the, the the features being rather sparse. So an alternative to solving for uh, the parameter set is something called gradient descent. Uh, it doesn't have the same uh, problem of having to invert a, a large matrix, uh, but it uh, does require us, as we've already talked about, to, uh, to uh, step through the problem space, uh, perhaps potentially many steps, before we actually find a solution. One of the other advantages of it is, is that uh, this gradient descent approach actually generalizes to much more complicated models, whereas we tend not to have closed form solutions uh, in these more complicated spaces. For now though, we're still going to stick within the linear world. So, so as we've already talked about the gradient descent approach, uh, we first uh, guess at what the initial set of parameters should be. We estimate the error, estimate the, the gradient. So how is the error changing uh, as we change the individual parameters? Uh, and then we make a choice uh, of updating the parameters a little bit, a small step, so that error goes down. And then this process is repeated uh, until either error is low enough or at least error stops improving. Here are some of the challenges with applying gradient descent. Fundamentally, we can't tell ahead of time uh, how many steps we actually need. And, and this turns out to be very dependent on the type of problem we're dealing with, on the type of model that, that we're using. Uh, so, so this ends up becoming a bit more of an empirical kind of a question. It's also unclear as to what the learning rate uh, should be. Uh, and, and we'll talk about some of those uh, implications. But, but again, it's very dependent on the type of problem we're dealing with. So, so in gradient descent, we're explicitly trying to compute that derivative of error, whether error is mean squared error uh, or mean absolute error, Try, trying to compute that with respect to uh, each of the individual parameters. Uh, in, order to, in order to estimate that grand uh, gradient, we actually ask what the gradient is for each of the individual training samples. And then we add them up, add them together in order to uh, to achieve this larger gradient. This approach is referred to as batch gradient descent because we're taking our entire training set and going through this process. Uh, if the training set is small, then that's uh, easy to do. Uh, but as that training set, set starts to get much larger, it starts to get very large, then this process of estimating the gradient uh, in this way can actually get uh, quite large. Um, however, it is linear in the size of our training set. So we've drawn error surfaces before. So that is error as a function of some parameter. So, so E here is mean squared error, for example. And, and if we hold all the other parameters constant and just look at this one dimension of varying uh, W, uh, in, in the general case, we can have uh, an error surface that looks like this, that's really flat, it might uh, drop down, uh, it might come back up, and sometime later uh, come back down to an even lower level uh, than, than, uh, than it was at this minimum here. So this, these are referred to as, uh, as minima. Uh, 
at least local minima. This one, if this is the whole picture, then this, this would be the, our global minimum. Um, but it's hard to tell when we're looking at just one parameter at a time. So, so remember that our algorithm is uh, something on the order of uh, we have our set of uh, parameters. We're going to update these parameters by uh, taking our gradient d, e, d, w, multiplying it by some constant. And that's uh, this alpha here. This is the, the learning rate. And uh, DE, DW tells us how to change W in order to make error go up. So, so we're taking the negative of that so that we go downhill. So, so we're taking an existing set of Ws, subtracting off uh, a little change, and that gives us an updated uh, W. And, and a really good question is, how do, you, how do you make changes to that learning rate so that you explore the space uh, well? If I happen to be sitting out uh, if my W happens to be sitting out here where I am uh, have an error here and I ask what the gradient is, the gradient literally is the, the local slope here, the answer is it's pretty darn close to zero. So what that means for this, uh, this term in the equation is that this is a relatively small uh, value and that means that the Ws do not change very much. So I might change my uh, W to here, in, in which case my point is right here. My gradient again looks very flat, and, and so I'm going to take another very small step. And, and, the, and, and, and this is an issue that shows up in a tremendous number of scenarios. We have these really flat areas of our error space, and we get we literally get stuck in these areas, taking really tiny steps for a very long time. So, so looking at this, uh, uh, this expression, uh, one way to address this is by changing alpha. So we could uh, uh, change alpha by, say, an order of magnitude, which means that, that this second step doesn't take us a tiny bit, but it might take us, say, to uh, this location here. And, and here we have a, a little bit more of a, of a gradient. So that means DE, DW will have a little bit bigger magnitude. So we might end up then as a next step ending up over here, which has even an even bigger gradient. So, so the point is that as alpha increases, we, uh, we can escape from these very flat regions more quickly. But a real question is what happens in the next step here? Uh, so uh, this point here has a little bit higher gradient than the previous point. So we're going to end up taking a bigger step. So we might end up um, right here, which has a very large gradient. And this could end up taking us, say, to, uh, to this point here. Now, in this case, the gradient is pointed in the opposite direction, and, it, and it's a, a reasonably large gradient as well, so it might take us to this point here. So, so we might end up, ending, end up bouncing back and forth in this, in this well, and there are lots of scenarios where we actually end up vibrating across this well and never drop into uh, the, the point that we actually want. Um, and another, another possibility is that alpha is set so high that uh, instead of bouncing back and forth across that well, we could end up, uh, say, shooting from here over to here, which gives us a fairly substantial gradient, which could end up, end up taking us over to, to this location here. And again, we, we end up bouncing back and forth. If we're lucky, we might end up going down to the to the bottom of this well, uh, but in practice, uh, you can't end up in a scenario where you're just constantly back uh, uh, vibrating across the two edges of the well. An even worse scenario is if you happen to hit a particularly uh, large gradient, you can actually end up changing your parameters uh, very dramatically, taking 
uh, taking W way off of this, this picture. And at that point, uh, your, your model doesn't do anything interesting. So, so what we've seen here now is, is that uh, there are times where it's appropriate for alpha to be large, and that helps us escape from very flat regions. But if alpha continues to be, if we use that same alpha for areas where there are real gradients, then uh, this can uh, cause uh, other kinds of problems. So, so on the surface level, one way to address this is uh, empirically, we, we try different alphas and see which one tends to work better for a given problem. Uh, there are also modifications to this gradient descent algorithm where we're actually changing alpha uh, dynamically. Now, I wanted to give you one other perspective on the gradient descent algorithm. So I'm gonna draw a different uh, space here. So imagine that I have a W0 and a, uh, a W1 uh, axes here. So our, our current estimate as to what the parameters should be corresponds to a point in, in this space. And, and I'm going to ignore for the, for the moment the existence of any other parameters. Now, if we, if we uh, for, for a given choice of W0 and W1, we can ask a given training element how well we're performing, measure that error, and then ask what the gradient is of, uh, of that error with respect to W0 and W1. So that, in some sense, you can kind of think of measuring the error. Um, we talked about the global gradient of D, E, D, W. Um, now I'm referring to D, E, uh, J, D, W. Where, where the J there uh, refers to a single sample. But one, one can think of this D, D, E, uh, J, D, W as, uh, as the training sample wanting to pull W0 and W1 in some particular direction. And then if I ask a different J what it wants, it might give me this answer here. And a different J might give me this answer here uh, etc. So I, I would just fill in a bunch of these. And what this batch gradient descent algorithm uh, does that we just talked about is that it takes all of these uh, all of these votes, so to speak, sums those together, and that gives us an aggregate uh, vector. So we might end up with something along these lines. And, and that gives us a new W0 and W1, and then we can estimate the gradients again. And so that gives us, uh, a particular J gives us a, an opinion here, another J gives us an opinion, another J might give us an opinion here, uh, etc. And if I add all of those up, as the batch algorithm says, I might head off in this direction in my next step. And, and over time, W0 and W1 are going to evolve uh, toward uh, some sort of a local minima. And, and, it's, and it's at that point that the average of all of the training samples sort of pull against each other so that we have a, a, a zero change. Now, let's back up uh, to this very first step that we were illustrating. So what I've drawn in here is uh, seven, a, a sample size of seven, uh, imagine that my training set size is actually quite a bit bigger. I might end up with a set of points that's, uh, that, that looks like this, or vectors that look like that. The average of those vectors still nominally is something along these lines here. So, so red, uh, if, if we manage the purple case to be the, the global gradient, uh, and the red case is being computed using just a, a small uh, sam subsample of the training set, then, then red here actually serves as a reasonable approximation to, uh, to the purple arrow. And, and yet we only needed to evaluate uh, the, the gradient on a subset of the samples. And so computationally we can save on that. The, the very extreme version of this is to say 
is to pick exactly one of these. So let's see, let's, um, let's actually imagine that that purple line, the global gradient took, takes us in this direction and maybe, um, and maybe this direction on the, the, the subsequent two steps. What this, uh, in, in an extreme position to this, to taking a subset is to look at just individual samples. So, so let me clean up the figure here. I'll take out the red. Okay, so, so purple was our global gradient. So over all the samples in our training set, we had all of these vote, votes in different directions here. What if we just picked one of them and moved along the gradient in that direction. So let's do that. <clears throat> so let's pick uh, this one here. That gives us a new W0, W1, and we can evaluate the gradient again with respect to one of the random samples. Of all of our choices, we might, uh, we might still end up with uh, gradients being pulling us in, in a variety of different directions. Um, let's pick this middle one here. So let me edit those out, clean up. So we said we were gonna pick this one here. We can take a small step along uh, this direction here. From here, we pick a, another random sample, compute the gradient, and that might give us uh, a direction in this direction here. <clears throat> And the, the, the point is that uh, by, by uh, selecting just a, one sample to compute a gradient from and then taking a tiny step in that direction, we might end up with a very noisy kind of answer as to which direction to move in. But on average, we're doing the, the, the same thing as what the, that global gradient is doing for us. And, and hopefully by taking by doing things in this way, we, we can actually save a lot on computation. So, so this is what we, these are the formal definitions for what we just talked about. This stochastic gradient descent idea is one where we pick exactly one uh, sample from the training set, computer gradient, change the weights, and then repeat that process uh, over and over again. The mini batch gradient descent idea is one where we take the training set and chop it into a set of, uh, of, of discrete uh, batches and then and then we iterate through the batches and for, for the batch we compute a gradient uh, take a step in, in the that weight space uh, and then we move on to the next batch compute a gradient change the, the weights and, and on down the line and we cycle through the uh, the batches repeatedly one can also take a stochastic mini batch approach where uh, a batch is randomly selected at runtime. So we go out to the training set, we sample uh, a mini batch of some size, compute a gradient, change the weights, and then uh, we go back out to the training set and resample uh, a, a different mini batch. Um, the difference here is that these different uh, stochastic mini batches can actually have overlapping samples. Uh, it, and it's also possible that some samples won't be represented at all. But over time, we will touch uh, all of the samples repeatedly and on average about the same number. Okay, so, so here, these are the, the general ideas behind uh, gradient descent. And let's uh, jump into some Python code uh, that makes use of uh, these ideas. <clears throat> 